Hello, everyone. Welcome to Third Thursdays with Tom and Tim. I'm Tim Nutt. I'm Tom Dillard. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Third Thursday is a program in which Tim and I uh, talk about Arkansas history, Arkansas culture, a whole variety of things dealing with the state of Arkansas. It's an informal get together. We in invite you to uh, submit any questions or comments that you might want to make. Uh, but the main thing is we just want to share information about Arkansas and hopefully have a little nerd fun in the process. Tonight, I'm particularly excited about tonight's uh, episode because we're talking about Arkansas literature and Arkansas authors and uh, books. And uh, both you and I are uh, voracious readers, I guess. We, we are. Uh, I read mostly uh, Arkansas related stuff because, and I read mostly uh, nonfiction. So fiction, which we're talking about tonight, is not something I'm particularly knowledgeable about, but I have my preferences. We talked about art last week. I'm not particularly knowledgeable about art, but I have my ideas and thoughts and preferences. And tonight, uh, it's going to give us an opportunity to talk about some of our favorite writers and perhaps some unusual aspects of our uh, literary culture in Arkansas. I started uh, I started collecting books on Arkansas uh, when I was in college in 1969. I remember the day it was in the autumn and there was a garage sale, a porch sale actually. And uh, I stopped by just on a whim and I found this, uh, I found the book that was published when they commissioned the USS Arkansas, the battleship. I've forgotten when that was, 1903, 1910, something like that. But I found that book uh, and it was really quite interesting. And so I started picking up stuff. And at first I only picked up collected uh, nonfiction. But as time went by and as I came to know more and more fiction writers, I started collecting and reading more, uh, more fiction. So today I have a uh, quite a large, what I call an Arkansas collection. Uh, we're in Tim's uh, study right now, and you can see some of the books in his uh, in his uh, study. Uh, have you counted the number of volumes? No, I haven't. I've, many times I've started uh, an inventory of my books, and I, I've given up all those many times that I've tried. But I, I started collecting Arkansas books in, I guess, 1990, when I started working for you, the UCA Archives. And, and then over time, I sort of shifted from a sort of a both nonfiction and fiction. I've sort of shifted into collecting more Arkansas fiction than anything it's a, else. It's, a, it's an interest that can get out of hand. You know, anything that involves books can get out of hand. And before you know it, you're inundated with them. Um, I, I really don't collect fiction anymore. As a matter of fact, I gave most of my really good uh, volumes of Arkansas fiction to you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and that's good. I'm glad I did. Gives me the opportunity to shelve more of my nonfiction. I pretty much have my collection out and on shelves today for the first time in my life. I have most of my collection out as well, except for, I guess, a couple of years ago, you and I went to uh, a book collector up in Northern Arkansas to look at his collection. And I was able to, uh, we both were able to get some books for our collection. And I still, I have to shift my books being an archivist and librarian, you know, I always have to shift. And of course my, the fiction at least are in alphabetical order. They're not in um, uh, uh, Library of Congress order, but, uh, or Dewey Decimal, but they're in alphabetical order. But the thing, uh, you know, one of the things about Arkansas fiction, especially is that the, uh, in the last what 10 20 years the the um the explosion of uh self printing and and where everyone can print a, a book and so every what do they say everyone has a novel in them yes uh, or everyone thinks they have a novel in them maybe uh yes it's it's very difficult to collect uh arkansas uh, literature and uh, and nonfiction because so much is now being is now being published. A lot of it is very good. A lot of it is questionable, especially these self-published novels. But 
also every once in a while, even a self-published novel will turn out to be quite interesting or different in some fashion. Well, uh, interesting that you say that because we're going to talk about some of our favorite authors and books and in a few minutes, but, and one of those authors is going to be Elon Harris, but he started off with his, uh, almost a self-published, his first uh, novel, his debut novel was almost self-published. He sold it out of the trunk of his car. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it can, you, you can be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk just a little bit about um, people asking us questions, remind them of that. Right. Um, so um, if you're not on our email list, if you'd like to, you can use the chat feature here to give us your email and, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll add you to it. But if you do want us to send us an email, we're checking it uh, pretty much, I guess, during this show. It's the letters TT for Third Thursdays and then the word with, W-I-T-H-T-A-N-D-T -T at gmail.com. So third TT with T and T at gmail.com. Uh, send us an email um, and we'll check that. But um, and then you can also use the chat feature here. Uh, to send us questions. You don't have to wait until the end of the show to, to send us questions. Um, so feel free. The chat feature is located somewhere in your, in your, uh, your toolbox on your, on your zoom. So, uh, I know they're in different places on the iPads and the, and laptops. So if you don't see a chat feature, just sort of look around and you'll find it and send us a question. Thank you for that definitive guidance. I am a tech guru. So, <laughs> We got to talk in a few minutes before the show began about the first novel published in Arkansas. And I'm really not sure what that is. We sort of concluded that it was the big bear of Arkansas by uh, Thomas Banks Thorpe. Mm -hmm. However, would that really qualify as a novel? I mean, it's fiction, of course, but part of that great uh, Southwest, mm -hmm. Southwestern humor, that genre that, that was popular when Arkansas sort of became a state. Um, a good example of that uh, is uh, CFM Nolan. Mm -hmm. You know, he was writing as uh, Pete Whetstone. His, Pete Whetstone. Mm -hmm. And that, that Pete Whetstone is very much in the Southwestern humor uh, uh, vein. So probably a uh, big bear of Arkansas. Um, so that was 1840s, right? Yeah. And then you had Frederick Gerstacker who wrote his novels, the, um, uh, I'm having, I'm drawing. Well, the, the regulators, regulators of Arkansas. And, yeah. And then, uh, pirates of the Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, which is written basically in the 1850s, I think. So, um, and then I know that there was a novel that was written about Helena, uh, set during the civil war, but, uh, that's set in Arkansas. That's not, of course, that's not by an Arkansas writer. And I think earlier, the earlier ones were not by Arkansas people in Arkansas. No, they Thomas were, Banks Thorpe, right. for example, is not. Right. So they were written about Arkansas, but not, or set in Arkansas, but not by Arkansans. Well, let me ask you, um, who do you think is the most widely published author of, uh, Arkansas author of nonfiction, excuse me, of fiction? Novelists, but in particular, we had this discussion before we went on air, and sort of, we, sort of, and then we kept asking, we kept coming up with people. So, so at first, I think I said Opie Reed. No, not Opie Reed. Well, that's who we started talking about, and that's then who you started talking about. And then, I didn't, and then you disagreed, like you always do. But um, then there's um, uh, John Grisham. John Grisham, an interesting character. You know, Tim and I uh, worked in, in the uh, archives world, and we were at uh, the Butler Center in Little Rock together, and then we were at the U of A in Fayetteville together in Special Collections. And so we got to, we got to meet a lot of Arkansas uh, writers, and we had a huge collection of Arkansas fiction and nonfiction there. And... Uh, was it there or was it in your own collection that, that I, that you introduced me to Don Pendleton? Don Pendleton was actually at the Butler Center. So that was before Fayetteville. So that was in the, that's when you started collecting Don Pendleton. Yes. 
Tell us about Don Pendleton. So Don Pendleton, he was one of those men's adventure uh, uh, writers and sort of those pulp fiction type things in the in the 60s and early 70s. We're looking up at Tim Shelves yeah, because he's got a whole shelf of Don Pendleton. I never heard of So Don his Pendleton. most famous series is The Executioner, uh, which is, you know, sort of about a mafia. Uh, this is his first novel, The Executioner, War Against the Mafia. Uh, and the number one says, Mac Bolan, war hero, hero, launches his one-man crusade against America's powerful underworld, underworld force, the Mafia. Um, but yet it is an Arkansas title. It is, because Don Pendleton was born in Little Rock and spent his formative years here in Little, in Little Rock. Well, you mentioned John Grisham as yes. also widely published. I remember when you and I were uh, working at the Butler Center, this long discussion we had about whether or not John Grisham should be included uh, in the Arkansas collection. And then that discussion sort of got taken care of when he brought out the painted house, mm -hmm. which is uh, actually set in Arkansas, mm -hmm. Northeast Arkansas. Of course, he was born in Jonesboro. He was. He lived here for a while. Uh, an Arkansas uh, bookstore was his primary marketer for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I finally conceded that, yes, John Grisham is an Arkansas author, but I don't think he uh, has nearly as many titles as Don Pendleton. So Don Pendleton, there are like, I think now there might be like 140, 150. Are they now series. written by a committee? Well, they're written by a ghostwriter under his name. Of course, he, he's been, he's pa he passed away years ago, but he wrote the first 33 in that series. And then after he left, uh, and it still continued under his name, but it was written by uh, other people, uh, he started another series uh, uh, with uh, a character named Cop, C-O-P-P. -P. This is Cop for Hire. Uh, and so that was his second series. So I think he probably wrote himself maybe 40 books, 40 novels. That's a pretty substantial list. Yeah. And we did not check to see how many John Grisham is up to now. No. Plus, he's still relatively young. Yeah. Turning them out mm -hmm. seems like weekly. Um, and then, so I guess it's, it's probably between Don Pendleton and John Grisham. Or, we didn't talk about this, it could be uh, um, Hamilton. Um, not, um, I can't remember her name. She wrote. She writes these uh, vampire uh, type novels. Uh, Laurel K. Hamilton, and she's written a whole bunch of them. Yes. So I don't know how many are, there are of those. Um. Why don't you talk about uh, some of your favorite writers? So I'm going to uh, share the screen, and so we can um, talk about this, and that forward. So first, I think both of us are fans of, Don, of Donald Harrington. Yes, very much so. And Donald Harrington uh, created the uh, fictional town of Staymore. And what were the, who, what are the citizens of Staymore called? Staymorons. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the great uh, literary creations of Arkansas history. And uh, he, um, so my favorite Donald Harrington novel is With one of his later novels. And also a very difficult subject to write about. Right. Uh, it really, well, on the surface, maybe it deals with pedophilia, but as you get into the novel, it, that's really not what it's about. But but the young girl is kidnapped. Um, I think with is right up there at the top. Uh, you know, architecture, the Arkansas Ozarks is always going to perhaps be the book that really defines him more than any others. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would also say that Butterfly Weed is a, is a favorite of mine. And then his book of nonfiction, Let Us Build Us a City, which started out as a Arkansas sesquicentennial project back in the 1960s, uh, 1980s. Let Us Build Us a City is a major work in Arkansas history. Mm -hmm. It really is a fine work. It's it's different. It's complicated, but it's so 
it's so gift uh, his it's it's a really fine uh, work of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that my favorite is with my second favorite uh, butterfly weed, and uh, and then the architecture of the Arkansas Ozarks. See, my top favorite, my favorite is with, and then I'm it's followed by the choiring of the trees. I've never read Choiring of the Trees. It, interestingly, the reason Choiring of the Trees remains one of my favorite is because when I first read it, it was the only time I had ever seen the name of my hometown in a novel. <laughs> so, so Bigelow. So Bigelow was mentioned in Donald Harrington's novel, The Choiring of the Trees, and it's when the, uh, the main character escapes from prison and he is making his way north and he crosses through, goes through Bigelow. And the so, center of the universe. It is the center of the universe. Well, I'm a fan of Donald Harrington's, but I'm also a big fan of Charles Portis. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you? Uh, yeah, we do. And we have Ke uh, Kevin Brockmeyer signed on. And so we're going to talk with Kevin Brockmeyer later on because uh, Donald Harrington's one of his influences. And so... We're glad uh, Kevin's here. We're going to finish talking about some of our other books, but uh, Invisible Life, Elin Harris, before we'll go on to Charles Portis here in a second, but um, we mentioned Elin Harris before. Uh, Invisible Life was kind of was groundbreaking because it was one of the first mainstream novels, I think, that that explored bisexuality and, and the gay community. Especially black. Yeah, uh, black, the black gay community. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I still mourn his death. Lynn Harris was one of the nicest people mm -hmm. that you'll ever come across. I remember when we, you and I were at Fayetteville, we were in the student union one day and he was there and he loved the University of Arkansas and was constantly visiting and everything. Uh, you and I just brazenly walked up to him in the student union and gushed over it for yeah, a few minutes. Yeah, we kind of fangirled out over it, didn't we? <laughs> or fanboyed out, I guess I would say. It was really wonderful. Uh, he was so, so engaging and so just plain old nice. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that was just to briefly mention that, you know, the novels with, uh, gay, with gay themes written by uh, Arkansas authors. Uh, of course, Invisible Life, I think, was published in 90... Five, something like that. Um, uh, and but the first, you know, who what the first, I guess, sort of the first gay novel or written by in the gay community was? Would it possibly be Cody it, by Keith Hale? I think it is Cody, yes, 1987. Hmm. I think Keith Hale got his start editing the really early. Uh, Active Years magazine, mm -hmm. which is which now, was in newsprint at that early yeah, stage, and now it's A Y magazine. So A Y, interesting. Um, and of course, Charles Portis. One well, of your favorites. I I must admit I am a a real fan of Charles Portis. I've I have uh, read everything he's written. Not that I can recall it, of course. Uh, and I just recently listened to the Dog of the South as an audio book. And at first I did not like it at all. I thought the narrator's voice was not very good, but then as it went along, it was just really extraordinary. And it reminded me what a great, great uh, book this was. I've now read it, I don't know, several times. Um, and I would have to say that this is, this is one of my favorites. However, uh, well, uh, you know, we can't talk about Charles Portis without mentioning True Grit. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's any Arkansan out there who has not read True Grit, um, then they need to beg for forgiveness and rectify the situation. True Grit's a great book, G great book of humor, for one thing. My friend John uh, is such a fan of, of True Grit that when he got his new dog, he named his, his Welsh Terrier Matty Ross. Matty Ross. After the main character. Well, let's just hope that the dog is a little bit easier managed than Matty Ross, the character. Yeah. But I will have to say that, you know, I guess if I had to choose my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, Charles Portis book, it would be Masters of Atlantis. It is just 
really uh, it's just a knee slapping, funny, funny book. And also in the post Trump era, it has a lot more relevance than it did beforehand. Uh, Masters of Atlantis is this really wacko novel about a group of people who after World War I start their own fraternal order called the Masters of Atlantis. And um, there are so many interesting characters in this book. And one of my favorite is uh, Austin Popper. Austin Popper, uh, you know, uh, movements like that draw, attract interesting, different people, maybe a certain number of shysters. And Austin Popper probably is one of those. Here's a little quote. He's in a bar. He likes his liquor. In a short time, he came to like the rum, which he had not liked earlier, and to actually prefer it. The cheaper and rawer it, wa rawer it was, the better he liked it. He reflected on this quirk of human nature and told June Mack, the barmaid, that if it was one of God's most merciful blessings that people grew to love the things that necessarily compel them to eat and drink. The Hindus, for example, ate nothing but rice, and you would have to use bayonets to make them eat chicken and dumplings. It was the same with the Eskimos and their blubber. Don't, whatever you do, do try to snatch blubber away from an Eskimo and force on him a 32-ounce T-bone steak, medium well, with grilled onions and roasted potatoes. That's kind of an introduction to one of my favorite characters in Masters of Atlantis. If, and the reason that, that this is so relevant today is because it will remind you so much of the Trump phenomenon as you read this. You can see many of the most outrageous aspects of the Trump era uh, there are manifestations in this book that are so similar to that. It's really great. I urge you to read Masters of Atlantis if you never have. Um, I am not going to say anything that you cracked the spine on my copy of Masters of Atlantis. I did not crack the spine. It's on recording. We can go back and look at it, actually. <laughs> Let's move forward. I want to mention uh, John Horner Jacobs as one of my favorite authors. Uh, this Dark Earth... Uh, it's, it's about a zombie apocalypse and it's, it starts in Pine Bluff um, and it just, it's, it's a wonderful book. Where else would a zombie apocalypse start but Pine Bluff? Mm -hmm. And then there's this great scene in there where they're in the Bobby Hopper, Hopper tunnel up and, and fighting off zombies. It's a great, great book. And I'm not usually a fan of zombies, but I, I love that book. And I was turned on to this by uh, our former co co-worker, Valerie Robertson who loved it as well. Um, and of course, I love Trenton Lee Stewart. His Mysterious Benedict Society series is great. Um, he's a graduate of Hendrix, I believe. And uh, I just love that whole series. Um, and of course, you and I both love Kevin Brockmeyer. And um, we're glad to have Kevin here tonight. My favorite of, of Kevin's books is The Brief History of the Dead. And I guess my favorite is probably The Truth About Celia. It's a painful book, but still just a really wonderful work of fiction. Um, so, Kevin, I'm, we're going we're, we're gonna to introduce you now. We're glad to have you here. Uh, you are a native of Little Rock. You've received all these awards for your books, and your novels are just, are, are just great. And City of Names is also up on the screen because I love City of Names. Even it's a, it's a young adult uh, novel. But um, so welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm chuckling a little bit because uh, the picture you shared of me, I was wearing exactly the same outfit <laughs> tonight. <laughs> well, I'd like to say that we planned that, but we didn't yeah. plan that. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. And uh, Tom and I are both uh, fans of your work. And um, won't you start by just sort of telling everyone um, sort of your background, how you got into writing and, and things like that. 
Okay. Um, well, I was indeed uh, raised in Little Rock. Uh, uh, I was always interested in writing. I always wrote to keep myself entertained, uh, but it wasn't until I was about 18 that I decided it was what I wanted to concentrate on and that I would try to make a career out of it eventually. Um, so I studied uh, creative writing, philosophy, and theater in college. That's what I concentrated in. And then I uh, took a graduate degree in fiction writing from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, I've maintained an association with them. When I'm not here in Little Rock, I'm in Iowa City. Uh, so I teach there as a visiting professor with some frequency. I'll be heading back next spring for I think my seventh uh, visiting semester. Um, I began publishing books in 2002, uh, Things That Fall From the Sky uh, and City of Names. Both came out within a couple weeks of each other. Uh, Things That Fall From the Sky is a story collection for adults. Uh, City of Names is a novel for children. Um, and I have kept publishing since then, um, mostly for adults, uh, but with one additional novel for children. Um, my latest book came out just a few months ago. Uh, it's called The Ghost Variations, 100 Stories. We both have our copies. Yes, we all, uh, have all our three of us have our copies. Yes. Um, so that is uh, basically that's my life as a, a, a writer and a teacher. Uh, like the two of you, I'm also an avid reader and book collector. Um, you introduced me to the names of some Arkansas writers whose work I don't know. Um, but there are quite a few uh, kind of living and working Arkansas writers I absolutely adore. Um, among them, Donald Harrington. Uh, and I, I should mention that my own favorite of his novels uh, did not make either of your lists. Um, although I love The Choiring of the Trees and With and Butterfly Weed and Architecture of the Arkansas Ozarks, my number one is The Cockroaches of Staymore, um, which is, you know, maybe the least likely of his novels right. um but he he signed it for me once and uh he said that of all of his books it was the one that seemed to share a key with my own work uh the most and that that might be part of the reason that it's special to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well donald harrington was a special uh person uh and I, we both tom and i were uh were able to really to get to know him when we were both at Fayetteville and develop a friendship with him. One of the highlights of my professional career was uh, acquiring his papers after his death mm -hmm. for UA Special Collections, uh, and it's a it's a good collection. Mm -hmm. And you, um, uh, Donald, uh, received the uh, um, some sort of award from Oxford American, and you did the sort of the introduction. Uh, to him for that award. And I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank as to the name of the award. Yeah, it was, it's the Oxford American Lifetime Achievement Award in Southern Fiction, I think is what they called it, or in Southern Literature, maybe. Um, Donald Harrington was the first recipient. Charles Portis was the second recipient. And then they just stopped giving it out. <laughs> so it's just, they've got a very fine track record, though. Um, and I, you know, I, you were talking about Donald Harrington signing your co your uh, copy of The Cockroaches of Staymore. One time I had an advanced reading copy of one of his novels and um, I had him, wanted him to sign it. And so in the, in the, on the, in the book, he signed it to Tim, who knows the value of an advanced reading copy. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a great sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and one thing I like about, uh, besides your work, I love your work, Kevin, but one, another thing that I love about you is that you're, you're, you're a list maker. I very much am. Uh, and those lists have become more easily accessible than they ever were. Mm -hmm. uh, I launched a website um, roughly a year ago. It's kevinbrockmeyer.com. And uh, I have been keeping and updating a long sequence of quite varied lists on that site. There's a site that's dedicated, a page that's dedicated to those lists. I'm up to, I guess, list number 370 right now. Um, I, was I do have a Donald Harrington list. Yeah, you do. And I was looking at those lists today and, this, and I was just wanted to say that the, I had to keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to get to the end of your list. But you do have a Donald Harrington list that I printed out. You can't see mm -hmm. it. But, uh, and the Cockroaches of Staymore is your number one. Donald Harrington novel. Yes. Do you remember yeah. what the other four are? Uh, the other four would be The Choiring of the Trees, uh, Butterfly Weed, 
with an architecture of the Arkansas Ozarks, probably in that order. That is, that, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Have so you went, had, uh, <laughs> well, let's continue with this list uh, business. I know I have seen, uh, at one time you had a list of like the hundred great books that everybody ought to read or something like that. You have uh, 50 favorite books of your own. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about some of those favorite uh, books uh, and why they're on your list, just off the top of your head. Okay. Um, well, uh, it, it, I guess that I would have to say that my number one guy is Italo Calvino, uh, the great 20th century Italian novelist. Uh, to my mind, the finest literary talent of the 20th century. Um, he's not, he's, he's spoken of quite reverently by other writers. He's usually not singled out for kind of the gold medal, um, but he's extraordinarily important to me. Um, and I often find that when I've got a literary task of some kind in mind that seems impossible to accomplish, I can look at Calvino's library and realize that he had the same task in mind at some point and wanted to accomplish the same thing, whether or not you know, he managed to do it. Like he, he kind of ventured in that direction. Um, my favorite of his novels is called The Baron in the Trees. Uh, it, and I've, I've got a list of my favorite Calvino books also on uh, that list page. Um, but The Baron in the Trees is special to me in part because it's not technically a work of fantasy. Um, it, it's, it, it could have happened. It's just supremely unlikely. So it reads like fantasy. It's the story of, a, I believe, a 17th century Italian nobleman who climbs into a tree in his front yard when he's a child in a fit of pique. Uh, says that he will never step foot on the ground again and doesn't. So he spends a lifetime in the canopy of trees surrounding his village um, and manages to live an extraordinarily rich life in this very unlikely environment. Um, but one of the things I love so much about his, that book and about his work in general uh, is that it just seems to be suffused with joy. Uh, you get the sense that he considered it a great pleasure and a privilege simply to be able to spend his life writing fiction. Um, and there are lots of writers whose work I adore who are suffused with melancholy or grief. Uh, you know, I'm responsive to those tones as well. Um, but Calvino is not that kind of writer. And I feel as if I can recommend him with great confidence to almost anybody without feeling that I'm going to depress them. <laughs> um, so he's very important to me. Um, right now I'm reading, uh, I'm finishing up a novel that I had never read by a British writer named Nick Harkaway. Uh, there is a book of his on my list of 50 favorites uh, called The Gone Away World. It was his first novel. Um, it's, he's writing under a pseudonym. He's actually the son of the, the British spy novelist, John Le Carre. Uh, but he writes under the pseudonym Nick Harkaway and has adopted an alternate pseudonym, Aidan Truhan, to write crime novels. Um, I'm reading one of those right now. Uh, it's the, the only one of his books that I had not previously read. Um, and I could talk about anybody else on that list if you're curious, so we can venture on to other topics. I love that you have Oct Octavia Butler on your mm -hmm. list. She's a, a, a just a really fantastic writer. Uh, and uh, I think Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, uh, two of her books. Um, uh, great. If you have not read Octavia Butler, you should do so. I think that's right. And I think really she's one of those writers, like there's no there's no necessary starting point. I think you can pick up any one of her books and feel dedicated to the kind of world she's building. And I think you have, uh, I noticed, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you have two Arkansas writers on your list, top 50 books, right? Um, Donald Harrington okay. and who's the other one that? I, John Williams Stoner. Oh yes, John Williams Stoner, yeah. Um, it, uh, Williams is, it's tough to figure out whether or not to associate him with Arkansas. He did live here in Fayetteville for many years, right. but he did all of his publishing before he moved to the state. Mm -hmm. I like to claim him for Arkansas anyway, because his work is so beautiful. Um, 
I was listening in. I knew that the two of you were going to talk about some of your favorite Arkansas writers. Uh, and so I figured that I would prep just a very brief, quick list of five, uh, five Arkansas books that I thought maybe the two of you would neglect to mention. And I, I think you probably know most of these books anyway, but let me toss them out here real quick. Just yeah, so that please. anybody who's listening in will have the benefit of like hearing about them if they don't know them already. Um, the Dixie Association by Donald Hayes. Uh, he's taught creative writing in Fayetteville for many years. Uh, it's an early book by him. It's the best novel I've ever read about baseball and is set in the state of Arkansas. Uh, proceeding chronologically, um, Around Centralia Square might be the next one that was published. It's by uh, former UALR professor Dennis Venata. Um, I think it is. it was published by a tiny, tiny press out of Missouri. Um, but it is quite an amazing piece of work. Um, and I think is every bit as good as any other novel that's been produced out of the state of Arkansas. It was published maybe a decade ago. Um, the Mimic's Own Voice by Tom Williams, who has come and gone from Arkansas, but he's now a Dean of the College of uh, Arts and Letters, maybe at UCA. Uh, he's published fiction. He's got a short novella called The Mimic's Own Voice, uh, which reads like kind of a comic worth of fiction of the likes that Donald Bartholome might have published. Mm -hmm. um, and then very recently, uh, Watershed by the Little Rock novelist Mark Barr. It's his debut book, a uh, very fine work of historical fiction, and a story collection by the Little Rock writer Jen Fox uh, called Mannequin and Wife uh, that sort of occupies the borderlands between fantasy and realism in a way that's very dear to my heart. I... Uh don't think I've read any of those. Well, that gives me a reading list. That's for yeah. sure. Okay. Well, <laughs> this, I guess our conversation will be recorded and archived. So if I went too quickly, you can look it up. Um, but I did, you and, and, and Jen did a, uh, a conversation for Words, Wordsworth Books a couple of months ago or two or three months ago. And I listened in on that and that was, that was so interesting and I enjoyed that. So, I'm glad. Yeah, that was a, a launch event for her debut collection, Mannequin and Wife. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's talk about your book, some of your books. And, and I know it, asking you to choose your favorite book is probably like cho asking to choose a favorite child. But uh, do you have a, one of your own works that you uh, prefer more than the others? Or, or I don't know it how is, really to uh, to to ask that but uh yeah i mean it's 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 difficult to consider um i feel as if the illumination which is a novel that came out in 2011 um is uh, it was a very intimate book to me um it arose creatively out of a period of a lot of difficulty uh and i think the book would not exist had those difficulties not preceded it um, so it's special to me for that reason, um, because there was some pain uh, that, uh, you know, I was involved in. Um, and if nothing else, a book arose from it. So it doesn't feel as useless as it might otherwise have felt. Um, I'll add that I always feel very happy when uh, somebody mentions, as Tom did, that the truth about Celia is special. Um, because it was an early book of mine. I don't think it's, a, it's been as widely read as many of my books have been. Um, and I'm pleased when it feels intimate to somebody. Um, and of course, my latest, being my latest, uh, is important to me as well. Um, I'm curious about how, of course, my favorite is The Brief History of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about the, the, your thought process or your, the whole process in general of how how did you come up with that concept? And, and maybe if people who haven't read Brief History of the Dead, maybe give a brief sure. uh, synopsis of the book, but I'm just okay. interested in your, your creative process for a book of that uh, sort. Yes. Um, so uh, the Brief History of the Dead is the book of mine that has been, um, it, it's been the most widely read. I'm, I'm almost certain. Uh, and it is a novel with two strands to it. Uh, one of them follows a woman named Laura Bird, who is isolated in Antarctica and gradually realizes that a calamity has befallen the rest of the human race. Um, 
And the other strand takes place in the afterlife, uh, specifically in a city of the dead, but not yet forgotten. So the idea is that once you die, you move into this city. And as long as somebody who's alive remembers having encountered you, that's where you remain. Once you've been forgotten by the living, you move on to whatever comes next. You leave the city and move on to whatever comes next. Um, and the genesis of that book was basically this idea of a couple different afterlives. Um, there is a notion from African folklore uh, that I discovered in a book by um, the writer James Lewin called Lies My Teacher Told Me, which is about how poorly history is taught in American high schools. Um, and he mentions very passingly this idea in African folklore that there are three terrains of existence. There's the living, there's the Sasha, and there's the Zamani. And if I'm remembering the distinction between them correctly, the Sasha are what we would think of as the dead um, and remembered. Uh, so as ancestors, for instance, they would be very recently deceased. Um, and then there are the Zamani, which are the dead who have been forgotten. And this idea struck me as very intriguing. Um, I kept thinking about it. And eventually I decided that a novel about at least two of those terrains of existence, um, it, there might be something to it. Uh, so it gave birth to the entire book. Um, I was most interested initially in the city of the dead, but not yet forgotten. So that was my, that was the beginning point for me. Well, the I remember first reading Brief History of the Dead, and it was just, it just really, uh, it was just a sad, a, sad, a bittersweet book, I guess. And it's just, uh, it's just always stuck with me through the years. And so uh, it's one of those books that you can, I can always go back and read. And uh, Thank you. Um, well, let's talk about your new book, though. Um, and uh, so it's uh, The Ghost Variations, 100, uh, 100, 100 Stories. stories. Yes. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, it was many, it was much longer in the writing than you might guess. Uh, it's a fairly short book. Um, it does contain 100 stories, but they're all two book pages long. They were one manuscript page a piece. Um, I had been reading flash fiction with a lot of pleasure and finding that that was some of the most energized work taking place, not only in American literature, but in world literature. And more and more, I was taking pleasure in those books. And I wanted to see if I could try to write a book that was in dialogue um, with that movement. Um, and uh, all I knew about the book at first was that it was going to be a book of 100 one page stories or two pages in print. Um, and then very quickly, before I had written so much as a single story, I thought maybe I should orchestrate the whole thing around ghosts. Uh, I had a number of ideas that felt to me as if they could be affiliated with ghosts or ghostliness or the afterlife in some way. And I had the sense that I could write stories in many different tones um, and that I would have enough material ultimately for a hundred of them. Um, so that was, what, uh, that was what gave birth to the book. Um, it was called 100 Stories or simply 100 Ghost Stories while it was in the works. Uh, and then that's kind of a dull title. Uh, so along with my editor, we came up with something I hope is better, The Ghost Variations. Um, I have not started it yet. You've read some of it, right? Yeah. Uh, it's fun. I, I, I love this concept of of uh, limiting yourself to one manuscript page. Uh, how, how did you manage that? I mean, obviously you, you knew you were gonna do it from the very beginning. I did. Um, yeah, I, I had not, I've always written with constraints of one kind or another, whether they're visible or invisible. Um, but I had not constrained myself to such a tiny word count before. Um, so, there were stories that adapted themselves very easily to that word count. And those are what I think of as the pattern stories. You know, you set an idea in motion and you follow it through and you put it through its sequences. And when you've got a story like that, it's fairly easy to expand or contract the idea 
to fit a page amount. Um, but there were other stories in the book that I think of as, you know, true narratives. Um, they were always rooted in some kind of conceit or idea, um, but they followed kind of actual character arcs rather than kind of logic puzzles. Um, and those stories were often very difficult to figure out how to match to my page constraint. Um, and it was just a matter of um, usually discovering that they wanted to be a little longer than I felt I could allow them to be. And so I needed to deduce what I could remove from them um, or contract inside them and still manage to have uh, a story that followed the arc I wanted it to fall, follow. You, find, you know, there's an old saying that it's more difficult to write short than long. Mm -hmm. uh, did you find that to be the case here? Uh, how much did it, did it require extra time for this latest book? I did not think it would require extra time. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to write a book whose motivating emotional tone was joy, basically, or fun or play. There's a lot of grief and sadness in the book. It's about death in many ways. Um, but there's also a gamesmanship behind them. So I was hoping that it would be a delight to read. And because I wanted it to be a delight to read, I thought, oh, it will be a delight to write. <laughs> like I will just, I'll zoom through this book because it's all about pleasure. And that was very much not the case. Um, and it was in part because the form was um, alien to me. It, you know, it was very familiar to me as a reader but as a writer, I had never attempted it. Um, and so I felt like I had to keep rediscovering how to write stories that suited that form. Um, and also because it was a book of 100 stories, I had to come up with 100 different ideas that I thought were worth a story. Um, and sometimes those ideas came very easily to me, but there were certainly moments in the middle portions of the book when I felt I was struggling to come up with something that fascinated me enough to belong in its pages. Well, you know, uh, it, it does deal with death a lot, but, but as you said, there's also a fun aspect to it and a, a unexpected things like, for example, uh, number, story number 64, they made him leave the afterworld when they found out he was not a ghost. Yeah. Asked directly, he was forced to confess the truth, that he was living and breathing. And before he knew it, he was back on earth, sitting on a thermoplastic steel bench in the food court of a shopping mall. <laughs> yes, this is, um, I like that story quite a bit. This is a, a story about the biggest grump in the book. Um, he finds just the basic material circumstances of existence to be quite an affront to his dignity. Um, and so he really thinks he belongs in the immaterial world of the afterlife. Um, uh, my, I'm good friends with the writer, Karen Russell, and she thinks that it's one of the saddest stories in the book and like cannot understand why I think it's so funny. Uh, but to me, this character is uh, in dignity is, is uh, very amusing. Um, you know, it feels Arkansas has got a long tradition of very fine, dry comic novelists. Uh, Charles Portis is one of them. Donald Harrington is not as dry, but he feels to me as if he fits within that same framework. Most of my work has not adopted that key, but there are stories in this book that feel to me as if they're in dialogue with that strain of Arkansas fiction. And Tom, the one you point out is one of them. Very good. Now, I, I was going to ask you uh, a little bit about your writing techniques and habits and so on. Um, would it be the case that uh, Kevin Brockmeyer can produce a thousand uh, words per day after editing? No, no, definitely not. Um, you know, the funny thing is that when I was growing up, um, all the way through college, I wrote very, very quickly. Um, I, when I, in Little Rock, I attended uh, Parkview. It, at the time it was an arts and science magnet. I think maybe it still is. I was in the, the theater concentration. One of my specialties was uh, extemporaneous speaking uh, at speech and drama tournaments. You would draw kind of three topics out of a hat. 
Uh, and then you would prepare a speech, uh, like a five minute speech. And half an hour later, you would be expected to present this speech. And what people usually did was just kind of make notes and kind of talk off the cuff. But back then I wrote so quickly that I would just sit down and write five minutes worth of material in half an hour and kind of read it off in front of a room. Um, something changed for me. Um, and I think it happened when I was in graduate school. Uh, I became much slower um, and began working much more incrementally. Um, so I had become the kind of writer who really can spend an entire day tinkering with a handful of sentences or a paragraph and really trying to perfect it uh, before I move on to the sentences or paragraph that follows. Um, which means that it's very unlikely, it, it's an unusual day. In fact, it would be one of the greatest writing days of my life if I produced a, a thousand words that I was truly happy with. Um, what I tend to produce are words in much smaller volumes that are polished and complete. Um, they don't demand subsequent revision or don't demand much of it at least. Uh, and I, so I work my way from the beginning to the end of a project in these tiny increments, getting only a very little bit done on any given day. Let's back up a little bit to your education. Uh, I meant to point out early on that you are a product of our much neglected public school system and everybody is proud of you for your work at Parkview and then going on. Where did you get your, uh, your undergraduate degree? not far away from here, but out of state. Um, it is now known as Missouri State University. At the time it was Southwest Missouri State University. It's in Springfield. Springfield? Yep. It's now become a quite a large uh, university. Yes. Yeah, one of the largest in the state. Um, it may be set in the state system of Missouri, probably second to Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to open it up to questions. If, if anyone has any, any questions, please uh, feel free to use the chat. But I have a question about uh, your memoir that mm -hmm. you wrote, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of blanking on the title. I know it has it's, Radiant Film Strip in the yes, title. Yes, A Few Seconds of Radiant Film Strip, mm -hmm. a memoir of seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and uh, uh, I, I found it, it, I could really identify, you and I are about the same age, so yes, I yeah. could identify yeah, well, I mean, you're from Central Arkansas, too. So, I mean, if you spent any time in Little Rock in the mid 80s, this is the book for you. <laughs> because I, like, it's, I concentrated um, with much more dedication on the actual landscape of this city, which is my home, than I ever have in any of my previous work. With the exception of one short story I wrote that was in the view from the seventh layer called Andrea is Changing Her Name. Um, which is a story that's very special to me and was also set in Little Rock and in fact, largely at Parkview, the high school I attended. Um, but a few seconds of Radiant Film Strip, it occupies one and only one year of my school life, seventh grade. Uh, and at the time I was attending CAC, uh, which is Central Arkansas Christian. Um, and I wanted to see if I could write a book, first of all, that actually abided by the truth of my own, not just the truth, but the facts of my own experience. I had never given myself that constraint before. Um, and second, there's a chapter inside that book. It's the middle chapter. I think of it as the hinge chapter, which although everything else in the book is strictly autobiographical, is emotionally autobiographical, that middle chapter, but plainly impossible. It's science fictional or fantastic. Um, and before I knew much about the memoir, I knew that I wanted to write a book of strict realism, um, in fact, strict biographical realism that contained one chapter that could not have happened and that the rest of the book would be influenced by that chapter, but would not quite recognize textually that it had been there. Um, so it would be as if you were reading, I don't know, like an Alice Monroe story. And in the middle of it, a character was, for a paragraph, abducted by aliens and then returned to Earth with no memory of having been abducted by aliens. Like, how would that affect the material was my question. Mm -hmm. And so this is a book that in some ways erupted out of that 
strange little um, aesthetic desire of mine to, uh, to pin um, an element of irrealism to a work of otherwise strict realism. Any questions? Uh, let me check the, I'm just thinking about what you said. It's just amazing. I, I wish I could express myself the way you express yourself. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to look at the chat right quick. Uh, we have a few, no, no questions so far, but please feel free to type something in the chat if you have a question. We do have some comments about, um, um, Char someone mentioned Charlene Harris as one of maybe one of the prolific writers of Arkansas. She is prolific, but I, I no longer consider her an Arkansas author. She fled the state after she got rich, so she wouldn't have to pay, she moved to a state which does not have an income tax. So Charlene Harris is not on my list of Arkansas writers anymore. Um, and someone mentions about uh, Donald Harrington's lightning bug, which I think uh, next uh, probably architecture of the Arkansas Ozarks is probably his most famous one. Yeah, that is a famous, yeah, I mean, and that's that, a widely read one. Right, and that one sets the beginning of all the characters, as as uh, someone points out in the chat, that sets the sort of the background story of a lot of the characters uh, in Stay More. Uh, let's see, um, someone mentions Richard Wright, uh, the Helena novel, and then uh, someone also mentioned that Richard Wright's daughter, Julia, published one of his previously unpublished novels, The Man Who Lived Underground. And, uh, and Janine Perry says that she's finished your, the ghost variations and it's a treat in its entirety. So thank you, Janine. Uh, and it looks as if there are a handful of questions at the bottom of the okay. chat. Uh, so can you talk about your experience working in the daycare at the Lord of Life Lutheran Church? Uh, and, and, uh, so yeah, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, this is uh, a daycare that is here in Little Rock. Uh, and when I was in college, uh, summers and holidays, uh, that was where I worked. Um, it was, uh, you know, aside from writing, it's been the most fulfilling work I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. um, it seems very odd to say that about like a brief period that took place nearly 30 years ago now. Um, but I worked with uh, these small children and uh, like I, I was, didn't have the same children every day. Uh, I, I, was, I was not a full-time teacher. I was not a year round teacher. So, you know, they would assign me to the three-year-olds or the four-year-olds or the five-year-olds, depending on what they needed. Um, I, I felt a real love for these children. Uh, and I used to tell them stories just to entertain them. Um, basically, I was a terrible authoritarian. Um, <laughs> I could not keep them from yelling and screaming and running riot, but I could entertain them out of misbehaving. So I would sit them down and I would tell them stories in which they were the heroes and strange and fantastical things would happen. And they would help me answer any questions that arose along the way. And I missed those particular children. So the children's novels I've written, I began writing those as a way of continuing to speak to that particular cohort of kids who were all older and you know were capable of reading for themselves. Um, I think probably I would not have written children's novels if not for those kids. Uh, I saw that one of the follow-up questions was whether I had written any subsequent children's novels. Mm -hmm. So the two that have been published are City of Names and Grooves, A Kind of Mystery. Um, I have written two more that did not find publishers. Uh, they're called, they're in keeping with those first two books. Um, they're similar in tone. They're books about you know, kids who are around 11 or 12 years old who tell their stories in the first person um, who are basically ordinary, slightly idiosyncratic kids um, who are met with impossibilities of one kind or another. Uh, the two that I've written that have not been published are I Met <coughs> a Lovely Monster and 1984, which has nothing in common with George Orwell's book. It just is set in 1984. And I thought it was funny to swipe a title, like the title of one of the most famous novels of the 20th century for my, you know, goofy little children's book. Um, neither of those you know, have been published, but if anybody knows a children's 
imprint that might be interested, they're finished. And I, I mean, I think they're good. I think they're as good as my first two were, um, but they did not find a home. You know, Kevin, when Tim and I were at the University of Arkansas, I don't know if you remember or not, but we had you come up and give a program and, mm -hmm. and uh, we invited uh, local teachers to bring in some of their uh, junior high students. And, and uh, we had a lot of kids there and I was just bowled over by how they connected with your, uh, your work. Uh, it was really rewarding to see those energetic children asking you all these questions and being knowledgeable about your work. Uh, th thank you for telling me that. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that invitation. And I do remember that event. Um, I think you sent me you or one of your colleagues sent me some photographs afterwards of me kind of with little clusters of children. Mm -hmm. um, so you, uh, are you working on another novel, an adult novel now or? Um... I am, I am. Um, I, I play things close to the vest though. Mm -hmm. uh, like until once I have finished a book, once I have put the last period in place, I talk about it, mm -hmm. but prior to that, I keep it as secret as I possibly can. Uh, and a lot of writers share this superstition, um, but in some ways it's just a method by which I like to try to keep a book's energies turning inward toward the material rather than outward toward the public um, to see what it's going to turn into before I begin talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're all, we'll be anxious to, when it's finally finished and you can talk about it. And of course, when it's published, I think we're all looking forward to that. Thank we're about you. out of time, but we have one, we have a comment from Celia about uh, maybe you should make a map of Little Rock, annota annotated Little Rock map about to highlight incidents from your writing. That would be fun. And, uh, you know, specifically a few seconds of Radiant Film Strip would be well suited to that. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea is changing her name and a story called Apples. Uh, the rest of my work is sort of secretly in dialogue with Little Rock. People who are from here always end up recognizing kind of the names of places and streets and restaurants. Um, but people from elsewhere in the country would have no idea right. that I'm writing about Little Rock in any way. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of reminds me, we'll finish up with a, an older novel, the visiting, the visiting Girl, that was set in Little Rock, but the names have changed. And so... Uh, the Visiting Girl was a society story in which the names of the guilty were changed. And um, I'm, I, must, I haven't read it in years, so I can't really talk about it, but it was a very early uh, sort of a novel. Well, and someone went through and uh, I, my copy of it, there's a- uh, Annotated. And well, it's not, someone has listed the characters in the book and then who they actually are in real life, so, so. That's good. Well, uh, we're at, we are out of time, but uh, thank you so much, Kevin, for being here. I, both Tom and I always enjoy uh, having a conversation with you. You're always such a pleasure to talk to. It was great fun. So thank you for the invitation and thank you to the audience for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Y'all have a safe uh, night.